Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're chatting with the members of the leadership team of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, including special guests Sasha Suda, George D. Widener, Director and CEO, Carlos Basualdo, Deputy Director and Chief Curator, and Paul Dean, Chief Marketing Officer of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Thank you all for joining us. This is going to be a great, great, great discussion. I'm so looking forward to it. It's so important to think about the history of this institution because the country has changed around it. And the uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art have been, has been part of that change. I mean, you document the changes of the world and, and of the interactions of audiences with objects, with art, with artists. You also have pushed a dialogue that is so important to having the country adjust to its new circumstances. So, Sasha, could you talk a little bit about how you view the importance of art museums and the experience of art museums from an audience perspective in terms of, of fostering community and uh, having people deal with the very complex nature of identity, of history, of evolution um, in a way that makes them want to come back and do this again? Well, that's a, a really a small question, and I imagine will will be you know that question encompasses everything that we're here to talk about today, and I'll I'll try to talk about it from from a uniquely Philadelphia perspective because it obviously there's so many ways to answer that question based on where you are, and I think that it during during COVID, uh, one of the great gifts that we um, received was reassurance that every institution has commonalities, but each institution has unique differences based on where it's situated, what communities it exists to serve, and what its goals are in relation to those communities and in relation to its its business model and its philanthropic model. So here in Philadelphia, one of the great things is that it's a truly international institution, doesn't matter where you travel in the world. It's an institution that people know. They know of the Duchamp collection if they're an art person. They know of the Sunflowers by Van Gogh um, if they're anyone else. And they know of the building if they've seen the movie Rocky. And so I think we're uniquely positioned to be both a Philadelphia museum and a global, globally recognized museum. And I think that for this post-COVID moment and this particular moment in, in America, it gives people an opportunity to engage with the broader world. In our case, we're an encyclopedic institution by definition. So um, how we define that now is another question, but you know, it was it was really built and founded as a place people could come and engage with the world, with artifacts and works of art from around the world that they could otherwise not see. Um, and so that it was a bit of a portal and a place that they could learn. Obviously, over time, that's changed. People, of course, love to come and see our Japanese tea houses. They think that's a really great moment. Um, but maybe it's not the substitute for going to Japan and perhaps even more than wanting to see the world here, people also want to see themselves represented within our four walls. And to me, that's one of the big changes that's happened to the industry writ large, but I certainly feel the pressure to do that here in Philadelphia. And so the kind of challenge that we're, you know, really grappling with now is that there has been a perception in recent history, I'd say in the last 10 or so years that the Philadelphia Museum of Art hasn't come down from the steps, that we have um, really stood by the posture or, or maintained the posture that we're here to educate. And we have, you know, been generous with that offer and that invitation, but we've been less open to collaboration and to acknowledging that we too have something to learn from those communities. And so how I see the Philadelphia Museum of Art is as a museum of Philadelphia, and those global collections are in large majority gifts from Philadelphians, but for the world. 
And those Philadelphians pulled together to make a globally recognized collection. And so I think now Philadelphians aren't giving art in the same uh, numbers or magnitude that they were in the early 20th century, but they're giving of themselves. And so I want to kind of shift gears and say, it's not just our collection that defines us, it is those communities. And let's become one with those communities, be more responsive and collaborative with those communities, and maintain that those communities, their voices, their stories, like the collection, are relevant on the world stage. And I think there we have the potential to really inspire pride civically, and we also have the opportunity to welcome people, all their differences, to feel like they're part of the broader story. So, um, Carlos, I'm going to go to Paul first. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do the capping thought, because because this is this is really interesting, the way you set this up, Sasha. Paul, you know, if you're going to make a museum, not about the objects and not about the, from the stair on down, right, from on high on down, but you're going to make this going to be about the people, uh, the people who have contributed their time, their energy, their art, their attention, right? The interactivity piece of this is so important nowadays, isn't it? And it's also understanding your audience. What what do they want to experience? 100%. A little bit about how, how do you learn? How do you, how do you figure that out? Well, you know, it, just like what Sasha was saying, right? We're, we're, our approach now is to come down the steps meet visitors in different and various ways. Um, I think for me, our goal with our brand is to be more collaborative, more engaging, more expansive, and more future focused. Um, and as a marketer, I'm not just looking at what's happening in the museum world. I'm looking at what are consumer trends in fashion, in film, in food, um, where, you know, we can reach consumers in new and innovative ways. Um, my team hears me talk about the, the zeitgeist, kind of the cultural zeitgeist all the time. And that's what we're trying to ride the wave. If like, you know, we wanna be in conversation with Philadelphians, with pop culture, with the world. And a very like specific example I can give you is uh, when Beyonce dropped her Cowboy Carter uh, album, we were the first museum to post about it, but we tied it back to our collection. And it, the engagement was through the roof and went viral. And it was just like a, a, a moment where I think that's what we're trying to do in terms of our strategy, right? Like we're, we're trying to be dynamic, we're trying to be relevant. And of course we um, revere, right? The prestige and, and history of our collection, but also knowing that art is subversive and punk rock and we want our institution to be an exchange an exchange of ideas and, and so um we don't want to just be educators we want people and visitors to learn about duchamp if you've never heard about duchamp we want you to learn about the japanese tea house if you've never heard about it so again it is just approaching it in a more welcoming um, and a uh, playful way. In terms of the marketing funnel, right, it, it's really um, kind of three buckets, right, where you're building awareness and then consideration and then conversion, right? And so what I'm really doing and what my team is doing um, is really building awareness, right? And so we're like, so for so many folks, not just for Philadelphia, but the world at large, um, are we even on your radar, right? If you think about the avalanche of content and news, like, are we even part of this conversation? Once we're on the radar, which takes a lot, right, to rinse and repeat that message, then are you gonna consider coming to see a public program or an exhibition? And then how are we gonna convert you because you had such a great time to become a member or, tell your friends to come check out what we're doing. Um, so that's basically the strategy. And, you know, we're looking at a very multi-platform approach where we're, you know, doing storytelling on social media, working with our com 
communications team to really elevate and promote um, our message with the press. Um, but then also thinking about all the various marketing levers and, and really um, applying some strategic rigor. Um, and I, I feel like we've had some really good success in the past year, and we're just trying to build upon that. Carlos, how does this affect the job of the curator? Because what, what Paul's talking about is sort of awareness and then building mind share. If you don't mind, Paul, I'll use that term, right? Building mind share. So that uh, you were saying, right, front of mind and then in an, an inducement to action, attendance, visit, you know, and so on. That's different than when you have a particular work that the only way you can experience it is through another illustrator's illustration of the illustration, the sunflowers, or later on photos, or then online. Now everything's ubiquitous. So that results in a change in how, you know, you you can you can look at any work online and it's different. That's that's very modern. How does that change the 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 thinking, the daily activity of your curatorial team, Carlos? It does affect uh, that greatly. You know, uh, I I think that uh, in in the la the last twenty thirty years have been revolutionary in terms of art history because we are learning at the you know, different perspectives and ways of looking at the same problems from very different angles, right? And uh, the challenge is how to translate that into a museum structure that was built, you know, for a long time based on, you know, smaller, well-defined territories, right? So how do you combine still, you know, the, the, the work of the specialists, of the expert, with the need to go beyond those fields of expertise to connect, right? To connect amongst themselves and to connect fundamentally to our audiences, right? So I think that that's, they're all, you know, um, operations that ultimately reinforce each other. The more that we're able to connect to our communities, connect our collection to our communities, the more that we're able to promote and educate as part of the same process, the more we will be able to work internally so that we bring those different facets to illuminate aspects of our collection and to tell stories that, you know, we, we didn't tell before. Uh, but but they are there, okay, you know, in the collection to be told. So one of the things that I find so interesting in terms of the cura curator's art, and the curator is an artist. Curators have a canvas. The canvas is a museum or uh, a canvas is a gallery or a canvas is an online experience. Curators are the artists. So like any great artist, you can take a look at components of a work or components of an exhibition, and just by making a small change, the title of the exhibition, all of a sudden everything is recontextualized. Any work okay. can be interpreted by a number of different ways depending on the, how the audience encounters it or whether a work is next to another work and how those two works interact. Talk about how your work as a curator and shaping those experiences and Paul's work as someone who is an audience connector, how do you actually interact so that you're working in unison in the way that Sasha was talking about to create this, this energy in the Philadelphia Museum of Art so that people who don't attend or haven't attended now are thinking, oh my God, I have to go. I have to go up those stairs. This is going to be fun. I'm going to learn something. Yeah, well, you know, the first thing is that I tend to think of curators not so much as artists, but of bridges, you know, and bridges between the art and, and the audience. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, in that in that regard, you know, of course, Paul, you know, Paul and I are basically rowing in the same direction. There's something else to it, which is that, uh, you know, such, we're part of Sasha's leadership team, and this is a a leadership team that in which, in which people get along very well with each other that makes everything easier if we're able willing to talk to each other uh, on on a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis i think that in terms of paul and i that's what actually happens our offices are next to each other and we're constantly you know 
touching base about this and that and thinking together about different topics. Now, there's one thing that Sasha said before offline, which is instead of you know creating certain dichotomies about uh, different aspects of the museum world, it's, it's interesting to think about creativity as something that is like a red thread that goes through everything that we do. And I think that's where we all meet. You know, and that's I think where curators are able to meet with educators, are able to meet with people working in marketing, people working in advancement, and and the audience fundamentally. So it's a full team. It's a full on on. So let me go to you, Sasha. That let's take Carlos's point there. You're creating a culture of creativity, and that includes everyone. It includes development. It includes your finance folks. How do you connect those dots and and create within your institution that type of energy where people are, as Carlos said, is sort of creating the next thing and they're working in unison? Is Is this really about fostering education, an open door policy? What kind of components as a leader do you encourage what kind of attributes of the of the Philadelphia Museum of Art do you encourage to foster that type of energy? It's an aspiration. So I'll start with that. It's always an aspiration because I think the most important thing to remember is that we're, you know, we're centuries old sector that is built on categorization and on a certain, you know, historiographic past, which is all about making it easier to differentiate between objects and and roles that people have. And I think that that works as long as you have all the knowledge. And we've now entered a time when we don't have all the answers. You know, we're we're institutions that are monolithic in terms of being predominantly white. Um, we are probably majority female now as administrators writ large, but we're dealing with collections that are that are majority male and white. And so there's all kinds of societal expectations that create the external incentive to think beyond what we know. And so, you know, you can't drum up that kind of urgency as a leader alone. I think that's one of the great privileges of working at a non-for-profit. And sometimes it can be a pain, right? That people always tell you how they feel about you. And so in sometimes you're trying to solve a problem. You're trying to solve for, um, the issues that we face and that are in, in urgent in the moment. And then most of all, I'm trying to foster an environment where there's always another perspective. There's always someone to learn from. And there's a privilege in, in these jobs because we have permission to learn. We have permission to go and we have permission to talk to folks and we have permission to come back with those thoughts and ultimately the authority to shape that feedback into our desired outcome. And the story, as you described, which ultimately the curator is responsible for penning. Um, but I think we all have now the added responsibility of keeping an eye out for our own and our own blind spots and those of our curators. And so, you know, that's, you know, enter stage left, you have uh, interpreters and you have advisory committees. And I think that those are all forces for good, which in part were, you know, entered to the scene out of necessity. And now for me as a leader, I try really hard to exercise a kind of first team strategy. So really like Carlos said, investing you know, 75 to 80 percent of my time managing my team and not, you know, skipping a step. And I'm not always, you know, innocent of doing that. But I think if I can foster an incredible culture at the at the executive level, then they they have permission to engage with one another and they have nowhere to triangulate relationships because we all trust each other. And then that that sort of that sort of cascades down. How do you all deal with with questions of risk, right? Because if you're going to be innovative, you're going to risk failure at times, right? Innovation is is not a sure thing, right? The sure thing is repeating what happened in the past until your audience has disappeared because they're bored 
and they don't want to come back, right? But how do you deal with that? Because look, no matter what you do, you're not doing something else. And the people who want you to do that other thing are going to criticize you for not doing that and choosing to do this. Uh, when you build a team, right? You hire somebody, you're not hiring about five other people, meaning five people are going to criticize you because you hired the person that you did, right? And, and you're kind of stuck in this never ending cycle of, and we see it in social media all the time, everybody's criticized for everything. Nobody gets a break. I know, well, that's, I think that's tough. And I would say makes it challenging to be a leader. But again, I think at the end of the day, we have, we're here to create impact. And so we can, if we're doing the work we're here to do, and there's as a civic institution, a, an embrace from the communities that we exist to serve, then, you know, we have all the cover we need to keep going. Um, there's always going to be somebody complaining. And I think in this time, um, we will only be looking back on what failure looks like 20 years from now. Things that we thought were an extraordinary flop will end up being a turning point for an institution or an inflection point. Stravinsky, right? You'll be Stravinsky uh, in, the, in the Rite of Spring where everybody is is all up in arms because of this horrible, horrible, horrible work. And then years later, it's like, oh, my God. Maybe. Yeah. Anybody. Yeah. Well, hopefully not that extreme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I would, I would also say to piggyback on on Sasha and Carlos, um, and and kind of um, the leadership team. Um, you know, we're all swimming upstream together, and it is creating a, a culture of creativity. And when you are creative, you have to take risks, right? And and. It, it's okay to fail. And I think when you're at a large institution, there is this fear of failing, right? And it's like, we got to move quickly, but also be thoughtful. Um, but again, I think post COVID museums, you know, they're trying to expand their vision and horizons to engage new audiences and new demographics. And to Sasha's point, this city is quite diverse and there's a lot and, and we have you know data that shows that a lot of philadelphians have never come to the museum and so how do we engage with them and how again how do we meet them where they're at and how do we introduce them um to our collection to different things whether it's you know american watercolor to ai Weiwei. like there's just so it's such a diverse collection so it's like again, it's 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 having a larger story, but then kind of showing everyone that they're welcome, and and again that that kind of tone, um, I think is very uh, important to to engage new audiences. Well, let's talk a little bit about the the, the board's embrace of this idea of risk, because sometimes boards can be very, very reluctant to do that. And I remember I was talking with the chair of the board of the, of the hood, um, and we were talking, you know, ex, ex Goldman Sachs person, and he surprised the hell out of me because what he said is he was referring to, um, to some of the um, um, exhibitions that were staged by your counterpart, uh, part, uh, Carlos. And he said, you know something, Mark, I loathe half of what is exhibited at the hood. And I love the other half. And the reason why I support this institution is because of both. The ones that I loathe, I still have to think it through. It's it, These are done by experts. They always have an idea. And sometimes I don't like the ideas but I'm going to experience them. That's why I'm here. And the thing about that he was saying is that it may, the way this, these were staged by the curators, the way they were marketed, the way they were communicated, the whole experience from, you know, the opening all the way through to the close, it was an enjoyable experience. So even the ones that he didn't like, he loved the experience and having that experience. Yeah, Sasha, could you talk about how the board sees this idea, these ideas that we're talking about here of changing an institution with such a renowned history, um, a collection that has a particular shape, how does the board see this and how are they coming along with, with, with these, these thoughts that we're discussing? 
first of all, the board is not a monolith, right? So I think there's we have a board of 70 plus folks and there are all kinds of opinions. I would say what's consistent across the entire roster is that change um, was necessary for the institution um, post COVID and a series of crises that we experienced. And that that change um, wasn't, you know, they didn't have a pre, you know, a preconceived notion of what that would look like. I think that the institution is going to keep doing really serious shows. It's going to, it just came out of doing an extremely serious show on Mary Cassatt, which was very research focused, incredibly um, academic at a certain level about Mary Cassatt's practice, really her biography, but also how she's how she's considered as an impressionist. And the marketing team created a really contemporary, slick, co- current campaign for it, which was so it was so there was such good response to it that we wove that design through the exhibition so that it was clear that you could do both. You could be contemporary, crisp and fresh, and that it, you know, in the end presented her in this new light. So Carlos, your team did the research, the foundational research, and you put that together. The marketing team was positioning it as Sasha said. And so you ended up with that kind of energy, that kind of uh, combination. How did the board feel about that? and, and you're also talking about a female artist that had been overlooked, right? That that where the merit um, for non-art historical reasons and not the quality of the work reasons, but for just attitudinal reasons that no longer exist, right? You're you, you're you're actually healing a lapse in the field, aren't you, Sasha? Yeah, and people loved it. I mean, I have to say, Carlos's team. You know, our team did an amazing job researching it, finding work in, you know, Barnes in Vermont. You know, the conservation team played an incredible role in, you know, removing varnish that revealed these these this unbelievable practice that hadn't been recognized. And when Paul sat down with the team and really listened to what the story was, they gave it oomph. Like I remember the first presentation, Paul said, we're going to call her Cassatt because we call Pablo Picasso, Picasso. And they took this research and distilled it to its essence, I'd say, and then communicated it in a way which was very image heavy that felt current and contemporary. And the curators came back, they loved it. And we pulled it through the whole show but it was still, you know, the way the show was organized, all of that was curatorial, the curatorial choice. But marketing was so engaged in the story that they went, you know, that that they they figured it out and the curator welcomed them in. But then Paul's team took it one step further to say, look, I love this idea of Cassatt, really her work and how much of a worker she is. And they went out and they engaged, you know, women who are leading kind of in not in the labor movement, but as as work, you know, workers, grinders, you know, in the creative, in the creative community in Philly, and created these amazing videos about, you know, restaurateurs and artists. Where at the end, you know, you you wouldn't know what it's about, except that at the end there was a strong quote from Cassatt about work that resonated with one of what one of them said in the interview, and it just said Cassatt, you know, Philadelphia Museum of Art. So it it was meaningful and thoughtful and tangential, but it all kind of came back to the idea that was at the core of it, which was quite serious. And I didn't, you know, think that that show would have that kind of weight. And Carlos can talk a little bit about how strong the critical reception was. And the marketing, even though it was fun and punchy, wasn't a distraction. So it's possible. And there is no dumbing down, right? Right, Carlos? No dumbing down at all. Absolutely. And, and we're doing that even, you know, we're moving towards doing that earlier and earlier so that when the curators are shaping their ideas, there's a buy-in from, you know, Paul's team and, you know, the learning and engagement team so that the feedback can really, you know, be used by the curators to keep thinking about the ideas. So it really becomes collaborative work, you know, not only among the curators, but all the different stakeholders of the institution. 
And yeah. again, you know, what we are mani- what we managed to do with that model is to, you know, create extremely sophisticated processes, you know, around all of this that, you know, there's definitely not dumping down, but there's, you know, an investment in making the content really speak loud to, you know, the different audiences of the museum. To kind of just piggyback of what Sasha was saying about the marketing for Kassat and the, the female videos. Again, my job, right, as a marketer is to digest what uh, Carlos and his team do, that vision, and then kind of distill it to new audiences. And so that was the strategy behind the, the female video series of these amazing creatives, again, who are part of the zeitgeist, who have been featured in New York Times, who are, you know, again, representing and almost mirroring Kassat in a modern day lens through their work. And so I think that is what we're trying to embrace. And again, it's a, a yes and approach. So we're, you know, it, it's not, it's not, again, dumbing things down, but again, being um, kind of an introduction. So and an and introduction to curiosity. So again, we generate awareness so they can consider to come to the show, right? And that's the goal here. And I love the implication of this. In order to create a, the relevant museum, the museum that is embraced by all fa- facets of society, nobody can be complacent. You can't be complacent, uh, Sasha, when you're shaping your team. Your board cannot be complacent as it shapes itself and its ideas and it connects the community. Carlos, you can't be complacent in terms of how your curators approach your work. Paul, you can't be complacent about doing next year what worked last year because, you know, popular culture changes all the time, right? It's this it's this ability of, of true engagement at all levels and the interactivity between the various uh, players here that are that are so important. Sasha, um, why don't you take us out with, with a last thought about how do you, um, you shape a museum that is so historically relevant, but you're shaping it to be relevant into the future and connected to audiences of all sorts, an exciting place, a place where Everybody wants to be on this board. Everybody wants to attend Carlos's ex, uh, exhibitions. The entire cohort of audiences are just thinking about, you know, you get the mind share that you've talked about, Paul. Sasha, how do you how do you think about the future of this institution in terms of from today into the future? What are you, what are your ideas around uh, this this museum and the museum sector in general? Look, I think we're we're we have one we have two limitless ass- assets, right? One is the human resources we have, and two is the collection at our fingertips. And if we can create synergy between those two assets and make them work for one another, then what we can, you know, the the invitation we can offer will be unlike any other. You know, people will choose us over the mall, which is one of our biggest competitors in terms of people's time over and over and over again, as long as they know that what they come and experience here is going to be exciting and new and maybe educational, but also, frankly, cool and values aligned. And those values, you know, I think sometimes museums get that confused with what our values are but sometimes people just want to be close to us because it says that they are sophisticated or that they are creative or that on a first date they're open to things that might not necessarily somebody might not assume they're open to and they're not just a banker or or what have you so i think that we have to be willing to surprise ourselves with what we find in pulling people and art together internally if we want to be surprised by what, by, by what brings people into our buildings. And that's the biggest challenge for us. And I think both Carlos and Paul do that inordinately well, is have open minds to whatever comes their way 
and what they have to continue to do alongside me and, and the board is continue to reassure people that there is risk if you do certain things, sure. And you could name any kind of controversial kind of one trick pony exhibition. And, and yeah, sure, there's risk to that. But the real risk to working in an institution in ways we haven't in the past, I think is, is just minute in comparison because what we see as risk, the outside world doesn't even register. You know, for us thinking about South Asian art together with East Asian art is really risky because those two departments were separate before. Now they're together. The big risk internally is will we over, you know, overemphasize one over the other? And what does that mean? Those are our issues to work through. Those aren't real risks um, in terms of our audience. And I think if we don't take on those challenges, because they are challenges, they're real challenges, then the risk to us externally will, will be much greater. And so in the short term, you know, people being mad and us ironing it out and all of that stuff, that's not real risk. That's that's the job. What a great, what a great point, right? You have to step into the breach, right? There, there's a risk of action and inaction. There's a risk of any decision and not making any decision. There's a risk of of selecting a person or selecting someone else. There's always risk. The whole question is, how do you make your call? How do you make it fun? How do you build a team? How do you create an experience? How do you create an, a, a museum that, that people embrace? Sasha Suda, Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Carlos Basualdo, Deputy Director and Chief Curator, and Paul Dien, Chief Marketing Officer, of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Thank you so much. This has been a fabulous discussion. I'm so I'm so now informed. Right now, I can take all the wisdom that that, or or at least some of the wisdom that you've shared with me and share it with other people. Uh, we I really appreciate it. This has just been a great discussion.